All right, guys. Hey, hey, and welcome to the wrap up. So if you haven't been here before, this is the Raptors Republic live post game show where we recap, we dissect and we have some fun talking about the game tonight. We obviously hope to have each and every one of you guys here tonight. Um, after every Raptors game, hopefully this season, you'll be joining us. I am your co-host, Sohal Abdi, and tonight, as always, we have my great co-host here with me, Oren Weisfeld. Uh, tonight, your Toronto Raptors fell short at the end of a back-to-back -back versus the Atlanta Hawks, 132-121. to Oren, let's get straight into this game. This was pretty exciting. Another offensive, I want to say, game. We didn't really see much defense from Toronto specifically, but um, what did you think about the game, the pace of the game? I loved it personally. Yeah, it was a pretty fun game, honestly. Like, I kind of kept expecting the Raptors to get back into it at some point i just felt like their defense was eventually going to click in and and get some stops it never happened but um you could see the fatigue played a role for sure but it was a fun game uh for the most part a lot of a lot of shot making yeah. a lot of just points and that's that's usually what you get with hawks games um i kind of expected a better defensive effort after the brooklyn game because they're a similar team to the Hawks, kind of. Even though the Hawks actually have a pretty good defensive rating this year, they still play really fast and they put up a lot of points. But yeah, different game. Um, the Hawks made a really big emphasis to get back on D, not really allow transition points. And the Raptors just could not get stops. But it was enjoyable. It was definitely enjoyable. I mean, we saw Trey Young, who I can't wait to talk about later. This guy has the refs in a complete bind. And I mean, like, it's what I, I, I personally consider it a talent. Like, when people complain about James Harden, I have a lot of my personal friends who complain about James Harden all the time. And I think the ability to draw fouls is a talent that really goes unnoticed in this league. Uh, I'm going to get into Trae Young a little bit more later, but I want to talk about Aaron Baines. This is a guy. Here we go. Here Warren. We go. <laughs> I'm going to need some yoga. Oren, this guy, Aaron Baines, has absolutely frustrated the living hell out of me this season. <laughs> he did look like he was having some progress the last few games. He did play well. I'll give him credit for that. So I thought we were back to the Aaron Baines we saw last season, obviously the seasons prior. Before that, it was kind of like, why did we sign this guy? I'm back. I'm back there, Oren. I'm back. Why do, I, don't, I don't understand what's going on with Aaron Baines. We couldn't play him in a game that we really needed to stop a guy like Clint Capella, who had 21 points, 15 rebounds. Um, what do we do with Aaron Baines? I mean, it's proven that it's gotten to the point with him where if we just stick with Chris Boucher full game, yeah, we get a lot more offense, but there's certain guys in this league that Chris Boucher just can't stop. Yeah. Um, he's definitely a matchup dependent at the five, but he's yeah. getting better, which, which, kind of allows the Raptors to play different ways. I thought it was interesting today that um, Boucher spent a good amount of time on Capella. He spent some time on Collins instead of usually kind of having like a Stanley Johnson in the game to defend those bigger fives. Yeah. Boucher is getting a little bit of that responsibility, which just shows the growth he's had throughout the season to be trusted doing that. He played the whole fourth quarter and the end of the third. Thanks. So that's not sustainable. Like, no wonder he kind of like was was kind of quiet at the end of the game. He played so much down the stretch that you can't expect anything. And like you said, that's that's the issue for this team when they go up against big opponents, um, especially a team like the Hawks who are big and fast and shoot a lot of threes. Um, the Raptors just aren't their roster is just not built to 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 beat teams like that. Like. As to why we signed him, I think it was after, after it was just due to the fact that the Raptors took a long time trying to get um, Ibaka and Gasol, and by the time they had signed, there was no one even that even as good as Baines left on the market. He was probably the best center at that time. So, you know, do I? I disagree with you that he's not an NBA guy. I think he is, but I think he's an NBA backup level guy, and he's playing a little bit out of his weight class right now. Yeah. By the way, Orange referring to the tweet I made during the game where I said, um, "quote unquote," I do not believe Aaron Baines is an NBA level player. This was obviously in frustration, right? So 
I said M Aaron Baines was not an NBA level player, and I will take any argument you guys like to the Twitter DMs. Nobody entered my DMs, so <laughs> of course people were scared of me, Oren. So that means you're right. Um, yeah, that means I'm right. So yeah. uh, no, getting back to Aaron Baines, I mean two points, fifteen minutes, uh, one for five shooting, two turnovers, three fouls, like. This was one of those games where I was like, Aaron, this has to be a game where you don't even have to play all that great offensively. We just need you defensively to slow down a guy like Capella. Because I know personally Boucher can score against a guy like Capella. He's going to make life miserable for him offensively. Cap guys like Capella don't like being on the perimeter where Chris Boucher is running these pick and pops and he's standing and he's coming downhill. Guys like Clint Capella hate that, right? And Baines is that type of guy that I wanted to play in those spurts where we really needed to stop Clint Capella on, on the glass. That didn't happen. Like you said, Boucher closed out the last 13, 14 minutes of the game. Played a great game, Chris Boucher. Let's get into him a little bit. He had 29 points, 10 rebounds, 13 free throws attempted. I had to write that down because... they said it was a career high for uh, points at or, or free throw attempts, one of the two. Yeah, it had to be for free throw attempts because 13 for Chris Boucher was absolutely insane. Is Chris yeah. Boucher reaching that level now where it's like for fans where it's like, Hey guys, we, we got to bench Baines now, you know, sometimes regardless of matchups, like to, to be honest, the Capella Baines, the Capella, sorry, uh, Boucher matchup isn't all that great, right? Defensively for the Raptors, but offensively, I mean, you have the edge there. So what is Boucher's role going forward? Yeah. Like I think, I, like I said, he can defend guys like Capella in spurts much better than we had expected coming into the season. Yeah. But I, I like look at today, Baines played 15 minutes despite starting and Bruchet played 33. And I think that's kind of a recipe for success. Um, I still see Boucher coming off the bench. And the reason I gave last week was just because he's such a high usage guy that you know while he can do the small things like clean up offensive rebounds and just and just like play in the pick and roll and do nothing else he's best used as like a high usage threat like when he's playing just because he has so much in his bag now like he's a pick and pop guy he's a pick and roll guy he's a short roll guy now he's making really nice feeds out of the short roll he had one play today where he like received the ball on the wing and just attacked a close out like very like norm powell-esque and just like pulled up in the mid-range after attacking a close i was like who is this guy like what what has this yeah. guy been doing uh Zarar was just saying before we started this like yeah. he has one thing on his mind and that's basketball like this guy is not playing yeah. around he's just in development mode like you could mm -hmm. tell he shot the ball a lot in the offseason as short as it was and it's paying off man like he's making some passes that people have said it took ibaka like two years to get down so yep. I love the, I love like out of the, all the things happening this season, Boucher to me is probably the brightest spot um, just in terms of like the contract he's on, you know, we have him as, on a team option for next year. I guarantee that's getting picked up and sure. it's really nice. But like we talked about last season, last episode, um, a better, an upgrade over the Bane spot would be huge for this team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at, at this point, the Toronto Raptors have to be looking at that situation like this. If we're planning on having any success down the road, the Baines situation has to be fixed. I mean, whether they bring in another five, whether Baines gets packaged with something else for another five, something has to happen where um, Baines has just been too inconsistent for a team like Toronto. And it really hurts to see guys like Kyle Lowry, who are just perennial winners throughout their entire career, just look at this team and go like, Oh, another L. It just is what it is. Kyle didn't even have the best game himself. I think he shot six for 14 um, this game. He had nine points. Uh, four for 16, actually. He had nine points, five assists, three rebounds. So Kyle didn't even have a great game himself. So I can't give too much praise to Kyle for, for tonight. Um, but I wanted to get into Siakam. So I was writing up notes during the game, and Siakam started off pretty damn good. It didn't look like John Collins could really stop him at times. Um, they threw Kevin Herter at times on him, which I really didn't understand. Like, I understand the, the length, but John Collins was on him, couldn't really stop him. He had 15 points in the middle of the third, and he ended with 15 points. I was in the middle of writing down, is Siakam back to all-star form? What do you think of Pascal? Yeah, he had a good game, and I don't think, honestly, I don't think it's really his fault 
yeah. that he di- he didn't have like more points than that. He actually had three shots only in the fourth. I looked it up too because I was like, he's getting what he wants, so why aren't they running more for him? Um, Robel, who is a Raptors Twitter guy, he he tweeted out something before the game. Robel, I think, is pronounced about um basically like pascal's play types his efficiency in each of the play types and he's being basically most efficient as a pick and roll ball handler but he's barely getting to actually play in that role he's mostly uh in an, either an iso guy or a post-up guy and i don't mind the post-ups because the post-ups are leading to a lot of doubles and he's doing well out of those doubles but like run some pick and roll for this guy, get some Lowry or Van Vliet screens for him. And then he can go downhill and attack. Um, And like, no matter what anyone says, yeah, he could have been more aggressive himself for sure. Yeah. He could have just forced those shots a little bit, but like, it's very clear to me that nothing was run for him down the stretch of that game. And that's a little bit, it's just confusing on the coaching staff. Like, Maybe he was tired and that played a role in it where he, he didn't really want to demand those shots. And I think they were all tired by the end of that, but it's, it's not ideal. Like we talked about this, about how I think the Raptors are best when Kyle and Siakam are taking the most shots. That's mm-hmm. the number one and two option. And tonight, when you look at the box score, it was not at all. That was just not the case. Like a guy like Terrence Davis had six shots you know, obviously Boucher had a lot because he was playing really well. Van Vliet had the yeah. most shots with 18. Like, it's not the greatest use of, of your talent. Yeah, no, 100%. And and now that we speak about talent, that brings me to the Raptors' defense. Because today it was really bad. Like 18, sorry, 19 actually for 36. They hit another three. They Kevin Herter dagger at the end of the game. 19 for 36 from three for Atlanta. That's over 50%. And, like, what we've seen from Toronto this year has been so – such bad defensive inconsistencies. What what do you think Toronto is defensively? Do they even have an identity at this point? Is it one of those things where um, they're just going to keep shuffling guys through? What's going on with Toronto defensively? We saw a 38-point second quarter, a 35-point third quarter, and then they kind of bogged down at the end. But what are we seeing from Toronto? This is something that – not a lot of fans have been used to seeing these last few years. Yeah, it's a good question, man. I don't really know. Like, I thought they had turned a bit of a corner. I still do think they turned yeah. a bit of a corner. Um, I think part of it, we have to just admit, was really good shot making from the Hawks. Like you said, they shot 53% from three and 61% from two. I saw that tweet. So that's partly bad defense, but it's partly just really good shot making. They came off three a three-win losing streak come into this game they really wanted it and they took it they just made incredible shots and sometimes that's how the nba goes i thought it was a pretty evenly played match in general both teams could score and couldn't really defend but the raptors just made less shots and and i thought that was really the difference identity wise i think once og is in the lineup um i think their identity is a small team that plays best when they're small, when OG is guarding fives and Boucher is in the game or Boucher is not even in the game and it's Siakam and and OG. Um, I just think that's kind of using their roster to the best of their abilities because they have a lot more guards than than, um, forwards. forwards, Their best players just tend to skew smaller. So I think I'd like to see them play a little smaller more often, not just in like tiny segments. The other thing is, I'll, I'll turn this on you. Like, I thought they had figured out a nice rotation last game. And then all of a sudden, they introduce a Terrence Davis back into it. And he just makes mistakes. That's like, if there's one thing he's going to do, it's going to it's he's going to make mistakes. Uh, also, you know, Jack said something interesting, I thought, on the broadcast. And he said, like, as a coach, he found the hardest thing as, an, as a coach in general, coaching basketball, was dictating – who gets to take shots in the offensive hierarchy and basically cutting out bad shots. And he said that after that Terrence Davis step back three, which was a horrible shot. So what do you think about like Davis getting minutes? I know maybe it was just a back to back and that's why. And like, what do you think he can kind of do if he's going to be in the rotation to improve? I think with Davis, we know that the physical capabilities are there. When you watch Terrence Davis, like he's, 
sometimes do for an offensive explosion here and there. I'm personally not a fan of him for multiple reasons um, that are well known with, within the public. But um, in terms of his actual game defensively, he's just he doesn't play mistake free basketball. There's just too many defensive mistakes. It seems like sometimes when you really, what I like to call player cam him, and you just watch him alone, he just doesn't know where he's supposed to be on defensive rotations. He's always late. Um, sometimes when he said it, when um, opposing teams are setting a screen to the top, which you saw Trey Young do a lot, and he loves doing that because it opens up the entire floor for him to see. And then he's got wing guys like Herder. You can even put Collins on the corner because he was hitting shots today. It opens up the entire, the entire uh, floor for him. Terrence Davis just looks like he doesn't know what to do on those screens. And I'm sure Nick Nurse had some sort of a game plan um, in terms of what, um, you know, how, how they were going to attack Trey Young. Terrence Davis, it's, it's really mental with him. And it's, it's so hard for me to just say it's, it's one thing with him. Um, but if it were to be one thing, it's just really the mental focus is just not there for Terrence Davis. We saw last year, he had some very good spurts of basketball. Um, but again, he didn't play at all the game, yesterday's game. This is the second game of a back-to-back. He didn't play yesterday's game at all. And that looked like the right decision for Nick Nurse. So at this point, it's one of those things where he's so young that I don't think Nick Nurse can play him until he proves that he belongs on the court. Um, and that go, that's just not just a Terrence Davis thing. That's, a, that's just a young thing. I mean, he's in his second year. I believe he's 24, maybe 25 years old, 23 um, he's still a very young player. He has a lot to learn. Um, I mean, normally, if Fred were playing this bad in his second year or Norm, you wouldn't really be surprised to just see them get thrown down into the G League for a couple games. Um, obviously, circumstances are a little different. But with Terrence Davis, if I'm Nick Nurse, I'm just not playing him. I'm not playing him for maybe a couple games, a game or two, until they finally realize that, hey, Terrence Davis, what, which one are we going to get today? Are we going to get that guy that explodes for 10 points in, in four minutes? Or are we going to get that guy that, you know, the game's tied, we bring you in, and now we're down nine because of defensive mistakes? Um, I don't want to go into Terrence Davis too much. I wanted to ask you a question, and I love doing this every show, um, where I kind of pose you as the opposing team's GM. And you kind of look at this from the Atlanta Hawks yeah, lens. I absolutely don't deserve to be in this oh, position. Okay. Let's go on. Okay. I like, okay. I like well, doing it too. anyways. It's fine. We're, we're, we're doing it anyways, Oren. So you're the Atlanta Hawks GM, okay? Um, and, and Atlanta has a really good blend, I think, of playmaking, shooting, um, athleticism, kind of defense across the board for their starting lineup, at least. You see it with Trey, um, the size with Clint, the athleticism with Collins, shooting, obviously, with Herder. Um, you're the GM. What do you have to do to this Atlanta team for them to reach that next level in the Eastern Conference? What are you doing? Because it seems like they have the depth now. They have guys like Rondo and Gallinari coming off the bench. Do you just hope for a guy like Trey Young to kind of just progress and Collins to progress? What are you, what are you doing? Yeah, so I really like their team, man. Um, yeah, I do too. They're, they're a fun watch. I think, honestly, if I'm the GM, I, I'd stay the course. Uh, I think they have a lot of young guys, really young guys, who are going to get better, especially on the defensive end. And, you know, start to show some flashes on the offensive end. Like, Hunter is a guy who's shown flashes uh, on the offensive end. He didn't even play today. But I think the final step for them, if we're talking, like, on top of on top of just natural development, which I think is the, the priority, just – Their timeline is a few years from now. It's not right now. Um, I think the other thing is like, ideally you get a wing who can create for himself. Right now the offense is so heliocentric uh, where Trey is running everything. And so some nights that's fine. uh, Like tonight, because, you know, teams, smart teams like the Raptors make a point to not let one player beat them. And so they took the ball out of Trey's hands they blitzed him on pick and rolls. They switched. They didn't let him be the one to beat them. But their other players shot the ball really well, and so that's that's just how they won. Some nights their other players aren't going to shoot the ball that well, and that's why a heliocentric offense isn't always such a good thing because it puts a lot of you know pressure on role players uh, to hit down shots and that number one guy. So ideally you want a number two, kind of more more playmaking, um, where you can just have, you know, take turns, go back and forth. So 
I think that's any team wants a wing creator. So that would be my only thing in terms on top of development. Yeah, for sure. And I, and you look at this team and it's like, I mentioned playmaking and Trey Young is obviously one of the best playmakers in the league. He can make every single pass in the book. And so can Rondo who comes off the bench for them as well. Um, but you look at the rest of this team and, and you compare them to a team like Toronto and you have Pascal, who I would consider a play initiator. He's a guy that, like you said, pick and roll, ball handler, can really do damage to opposing teams, but they don't really have that. I mean, John Collins, whenever he's handling the ball, he doesn't look like he can really do much with it. I personally think he has the ability to. He can eventually get there. I mean, you, you have that type of athleticism and that type of um, those type of movement skills, just the, just the basic physical movement skills that John Collins has. He's very smooth. He's not really a choppy player. I think he can definitely develop a little uh, dribbling package. Um, but Toronto has a bunch of guys that can kind of play initiate. They have Lowry, they have Fred, they have Pascal. They even have Stanley Johnson at times who can, who can initiate plays. And the Hawks don't have that save for Rondo and Trey yeah. Young. They do have Bogdanovich, I just remembered, who was injured today. Oh, they do have Bogdanovich, exactly. Yeah, he was injured. For this game, um, speaking of injuries, obviously Bogdanovich, like Oren mentioned, was injured. Hunter as well, DeAndre Hunter was injured for the Hawks. On the other side for the Raptors, Ananobi was obviously injured for Toronto, and then Patrick McCaw. I hope to see OG Ananobi back, Oren. I keep tweeting about it every day, man. Um, but I know you wanted to get to a clip that you that you wanted to get to. You mentioned it to me earlier. Do you want to get into this clip really quickly? Yeah, yeah, let's get to this clip uh, because our producer is, he's demanding it. So um, so this is, uh, like I said last week, this is one of the things we're going to try to do every week is show you guys like one cool X's and O's plays. And this is an example of the Raptors actually, this was a good example, I choose to be optimistic, of the Raptors just making all of their rotations really well, um, closing out on shooters, and it ends with, a Pascal Siakam block so it's playing right now basically it's it's about 15 seconds of of the Hawks penetrating the paint kicking out and the Raptors just continuing to make the right rotations and then the Hawks get an offensive rebound they go up with it John Collins goes up with it and and Siakam just swats it away Um, so yeah I wanted to show that a, because I think it shows that the Raptors are capable of defending a team like the Hawks. Like, when they're on, like they were on last night, they're on. And I think really today came down to, you know, mental lapses due to fatigue more than anything. You're on the second night of a back-to-back after playing a really fast-paced game in Brooklyn. Now you play another fast-paced game. It, it comes down you know, it hurts you by the end of it. And I think that's one of the reasons that the Raptors were just slow on rotations uh, for most of the game. And the other reason I wanted to bring this up was just because I saw on Twitter after this play, uh, people talking, I think it was, you know, it was Siakam's second block of the night. And people were talking like, Siakam, he's back to playing really good D. And I kind of take an issue with that line of thinking because while he made some defensive mistakes early this season pertaining yeah. to pertaining to letting his own man, you know, taking his eye off his own man and letting him get back get by him and you watch it and it obviously sticks out plays like that. I think you need to remember that Siakam has been put in a pretty different position this this season as a defender he's playing closer to the basket, he's more of a rim protector, he's more of the Marcus Sol than we're used to like Siakam is now the guy who's communicating who's really helping when his teammates get blown by and he's the one to step up into help more often than not it's him and then the rotations happen around him you know obviously everyone's going to be put in that position where they're the low man and they're the help but it, it's just the way it's structured because Baines isn't that dependent and because Baines isn't playing that much it's Siakam a lot this year. And so I think you need to give him a little bit of slack for learning a new role. And, you know, while he's so focused on help, he did let guys, his own guy get by him many times and that, yeah, that's bad, but we just need to be weary that like, it's not completely just like him being stupid. It's him being asked to do something different and maybe taking a little more time to get used to it. But I think overall his help defense this season has been really good. What do you think? 
No, for sure. I think Pascal Siakam, you go back to last year, and even in the year prior when they had Kawhi, the Raptors had Kawhi Leonard, I think that year with Kawhi Leonard is when I personally started seeing the flashes of dominance defensively from Siakam. And then you saw it on a consistent level last year to the point where we had a lot of people kind of clamoring for Siakam to make that all NBA defensive team. Some people were asking for that. And then as again, I always get back to this bubble situation because people love talking about the bubble um, and how Siakam struggled offensively. But I think defensively, he was absolutely elite. Siakam has almost everything you want in a defender. He has very good instincts and having good instincts as a defender um, is one of those things where um, they're not really taught to you. I think Draymond, in my opinion, has some of the best instincts in the league. A lot of people look at Draymond, they love saying, oh, there's a single triple guy and five points, you know, seven assists and five rebounds. But people don't under, you don't understand a guy like Draymond's impact. And as rude as this sounds, unless you play either basketball to a degree or unless you study basketball to a degree, um, a guy like Draymond can help you so much. And I kind of liken Draymond to Siakam, where he's not as great as a, as a communicator as Draymond, but he can do everything you can ask him to do. You can tell Siakam, to hey, take this five for a couple of possessions. He's not going to complain. He'll take him. You can tell Siakam to guard the opposing three, guard the opposing four, guard the best player on the other side of the court. Um, he did that a lot in the bubble versus Jason Tatum. Well, obviously, Jason Tatum has his moments, had his moments. He's a complete and utter superstar Um Every meaning, every definition you could find of superstar Jason Tatum's face is there. So, but I think Siakam did relatively well against him and Jalen Brown in the bubble, and he's kind of bringing that into this season. Um, like like I said earlier, Siakam scoring kind of hasn't um, wasn't there. I guess at the end of the game, you gave reason for that. Um, I I personally agreed with you, um, but I want to get into quickly before we continue, because again. We have our producer talking to us right now, telling us to get to our sponsor. So let's get to our sponsor, RF Qureshi. RF, we want to thank you, obviously, for sponsoring the show, for supporting the show. Um, <laughs> um, we want to obviously thank you for that. Um, and we're going to keep obviously thanking him for as long as he's supporting the show. Again, a big Raptors fan, RF Qureshi. His ad is below. Um, so we want to thank him for that. Oren, do you have anything else to add to this game? Yeah, just on, on Siakam, one last point is that um, people were complaining a lot at the beginning of the season, but like you said, I agree with that point, is that his versatility is what makes him so valuable. So the idea that like he'll never live up to his contract or whatever, like he doesn't yeah. actually need to do that much offensively to live up to his contract because as a defender, he's he, his value is in the fact that he's so versatile and can play with so many different players around all types of superstars at the four, at the five, at the three, defend different positions, play in different schemes. You know, that's what makes him valuable. Um, but yeah, I, I also don't think he's a number one option. I think we're learning that this season is that his best use at this point of his career is is probably as a number two rather than a one. Yeah, 100%. Like, we've seen that for sure. I want to get to one of my favorite segments again. Obviously, other than throwing that GM label on you, um, the wrap-up turning point of the game. Um, it was about a minute left in the fourth quarter, um, and this was quite literally the definition of the turning point of the game. Um, this was John Collins who set up the wide-open Kevin Herter shot. And again, this was great vision from John Collins seeing that um, arguably the best shooter on the Hawks other than Trey Young, Kevin Herter, finding him for that wide open three. And that was the dagger in the Raptors' hearts tonight. Um, the Raptors kind of were just punching back as much as they could in the fourth quarter. But that John Collins feed to kind of end the game from Kevin Herter um, sealed it for the Hawks. So that was the wrap-up turning point of the game. Um, so kudos to John Collins. Again, I, I like John Collins. I've been a huge fan of him. He's in a very weird strange position um this year um where he is a restricted free agent and you don't really see that for a guy like john collins um for a guy with his talent level um do you see the hawks kind of matching that at the end of the year no matter what offer they get do you think they're going to let him go can they afford to let him go um they do have gallinari again but i mean 
John Collins to me is almost like guaranteed um, re-sign for the Hawks. If I was their GM, at least, what do you think, Warren? Yeah, I agree. I agree. But um, as a Raptors fan, he's definitely one of my dream guys. Yeah. Um, with- I've, what? I'm with you. No, I said I'm with you 100%. Yeah, like he would fit what the Raptors do really, really well. Because, yeah. you know, him at the five, like, sure, he's small. So he's not an ideal matchup against, like, a Joel Embiid. But him at the five beside OG and Obi and Pascal Siakam, now we're, like, really talking. Because they can all switch. They can all, like, cover up ground. They can all you know, make rotations quickly and close out on shooters. And so I don't worry too much about him at the five against a guy like Joel, because it would just be doubles and it would just, I think, work really, really well. And offensively, obviously he can shoot the three like we saw today. He's a really good roller. He would be amazing. But yeah, like the Hawks are in an interesting position because they traded for Capella and then they also drafted Onyeko Kongwu, who I really like as a defensive prospect. Him. Yeah. yeah. So he played a tiny bit today, but um, it'll be, it, it was a weird pick for them just considering that they kind of have a future four and, and five. If, if they consider uh, John Collins a five at any point in his career, but yeah, I see them matching the money. They're still a young team, you know, guys like Gallo and, and Rondo, those guys are on short contracts. So they will be wise to do it. And if not, I think look at him as a trade target because if if they don't plan yeah. on paying him, if they're far away right now on contract discussions, then it makes more sense to get something for him than let him walk. Yeah, for sure. And as you guys can obviously see on the screen, that was our wrap-up uh, turning point of the game. Again, Kevin Herter hitting that three from that John Collins beautiful pass. Um, just his ability to keep composure on that play was incredible. And that just sunk the Raptors. That sunk fans. And I think that's that was the point where a lot of fans just turned off their television sets and probably just went to bed early Saturday night. Um, I want to get into a couple more things, Oren, before we go for tonight. Um, Atlanta, I look at them as kind of a middle-tier Eastern Conference team. Toronto kind of needed this win tonight. I thought they were going to bring the momentum into this game. Obviously, tough. It's a back-to-back. Second half, I should say, of a back-to-back um, what do you think Atlanta's ceiling is in the Eastern Conference this year? They have a lot of guys. And and that's going to be huge this year because as we're seeing with COVID and an increase of muscle injuries, you know, the teams that have more depth are just going to kind of be able to shoot up the standings a little bit. Yeah. So I I like their chances, honestly. I like their chances as much as a team like Toronto or or Miami to kind of find themselves at that five six seed. Um, but as as a playoff team, I don't I don't see them winning a playoff series. I just I just think they're too young, and and yeah. they haven't been there. Like a team that's that young needs to be there before they can actually have confidence to to play in those huge moments like it's very rare that a team that that young gets to the playoffs and actually wins because you just need experience in those types of situations so not that high on them just in terms of that youth factor Oren, that kind of reminds me of like the early raptors the mid 2010 raptors when they just kept going to the playoffs and after every playoffs kind of loss you were just like this team they deserve to be in the playoffs but that youth factor, that poise um, that you saw in, in in that 2019 run for for the Raptors just just wasn't there, you know, a few years prior. Um, they were playing guys like Terrence Ross, a young Terrence Ross, a young Jonas Valanciunas. You know, DeMar DeRozan was fairly young. Um, Kyle Lowry, obviously, maybe in his high 20s, but again, in terms of playoff experience, he was young. Uh, he wasn't all there. Um, so that reminded me of that. Um, I know you wanted to talk about the All-Star game. Is there anything you wanted to kind of tee us off with, with the All-Star game? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, you know, real quick before we, we finish talking about the game. Yeah. I think the the good news is that the Raptors are kind of back to being themselves in that, in that it's enjoyable to watch them again. Like, oh, yeah. even though this game we lost, it was just an enjoyable watch from the start. They played really hard. 
And I think I think they're kind of back just in that sense that this is they've kind of discovered who they are and their margin for error is really small, which we saw tonight. They're not that great of a team at all. They have structural issues, but it's fun. And I'll take that. No, 100 percent. This is um, I think one of the most depressing parts of watching the Raptors, you know, earlier this season was that you just didn't really recognize the team. They didn't have an identity. Now they're starting to resemble that a lot more. And I think a lot of that has to do with their defense. Personally, I think the rotations, them having such strong rotations over the last two years was kind of like a benchmark, a hallmark of who the Raptors were defensively. Um, You know, them being able to double and then being able to close out and somehow still contest a wide open shot with a guy like Boucher's length or last year with Rondé Hollis Jefferson's length. Um, Terrence, Terrence Davis, even at times, it felt like he did a much more um, consistent job last year defensively. And that's why this year you're not really seeing him get those consistent minutes. Nick Nurse has talked about it even publicly with him. Um, I want to get into the all-star game. Like I said, um, you know, in terms of um, players, all that stuff, normally at this point in the season, we'd be talking about, oh, well, who's going to make the all-star game? I'm not really worried about all that. I personally don't even want an all-star game. And I'm thinking about it really from a player safety point of view. I mean, from an entertainment perspective, you're lying if you don't want to see more basketball, but at the same time, some people just have obviously different priorities. Um, I personally think an all-star game makes absolutely no sense. The optics around the league have been so um, poor, you know, this season, everything's been managed so poorly. We saw the Kevin Durant debacle. We we've seen so many other things this season um, that really just haven't added up. What do you think about the NBA kind of forcing an all-star game on the players, especially with so many speaking out on it? Yeah, that's what kind of fascinated me is all the players, all the superstars speaking out on it, because you would think they would have some weight between like the the players association to kind of say no to a game like that. But I guess they don't. I guess I guess it was kind of. It seems very much like it was forced upon them. You know, you have guys yeah. like LeBron saying he doesn't want it. Giannis killed me. He was like, you know, the big dog said he doesn't want it, and I'm with him. <laughs> Referencing LeBron. Yeah, yeah. Kawhi yeah, said man. Kawhi straight up was like, they're putting money ab- above health, which is like, wow, you just said the the quiet part out loud, Kawhi. I don't know if you're allowed to do that. Um, but that's what it is, you know, and it's it's unfortunate. Um, I think it's interesting. I guess this is my take on it. It's interesting yeah. that the NBA has spent all these years building up this this really good reputation as a progressive league that's player driven, player run, listens to its players on a lot of things um, in terms of like social justice and all these issues. And now with the All Star Game and just with this season in general. They no longer, I don't think, have that reputation in the like context of professional sports. Like they're now in a situation where they're just like the NFL or the MLB, where they are going through with a season despite putting their players at a health risk because of money. And it's gotten to the point now where they're just being upfront about it. They're not even trying to hide their intentions. They're doing an all-star game for money and people are no, their fans aren't stupid. Their fans are onto them and they just don't seem to care enough to kind of keep that reputation as, as a progressive league that cares about their players, which is what I find most interesting about it. Yeah, for sure. And it's crazy because um, I personally obviously expected players to all have the same kind of sentiment Again, like you said, LeBron, Giannis spoke out. Harden even spoke out. James Harden, um, when they asked him about it, he just wasn't in favor of an all-star game. Said it didn't really make sense. And that's like the overwhelming idea. Harden's trying to party, man. Like, let Harden... Harden, honestly... The all-star game's where? Isn't it Atlanta? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. He's so bad. He's not worried about no game. You know what he's worried about. But honestly, um, yeah, James Harden did not want to play in that game, according to himself. I think Kyrie spoke out about it. Um, Durant had a tweet that went absolutely viral yesterday. If you guys haven't seen that already, any live viewers or viewers are honestly watching this after the fact, go on Kevin Durant's Twitter profile. Look at how he added the NBA. I'm surprised he hasn't gotten fined for that already. Um, 
just everyone really in shock that the NBA is going through with this. And like you said, the NBA has developed such a good reputation over the last few years, and this has kind of just eliminated it. Um, but I don't want to go too long, Orin. Is there anything else you wanted to add in terms of the recap for this game? No, I think that's it. Um, yeah, it was it was a fun game. Uh, we'll be back Monday. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Um, do you have any – want to want to wrap it up real quick? Yeah, for sure. So thank you guys all for tuning in tonight to the Atlanta Hawks Toronto Raptors postgame live show. Um, this was the wrap-up, and we honestly loved having each and every one of you. We see the views. They're kind of going up every single live show, so we really appreciate it. Um, again, this is the wrap-up, <laughs> and we'll see you here on Monday because I keep calling it <laughs> Wrap It Up. <laughs>